And I'm really delighted to introduce my friend and colleague and legislative co-conspirator, Representative <laughs> John Moschino, who represents the third Plymouth district, which includes the communities of Cohasset, Hingham, Hall, and North Situate, and is in her third term. Rep Moschino has served on various committees and several commissions, most notably the Joint Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy. Before joining the legislature, Rep Moschino served locally as a selectman in Hull for two terms and worked on numerous town, regional, and statewide boards and commissions. In particular, she served as Hull's representative to the Metropolitan Beaches Commission and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Rep Moschino is also a seasoned nonprofit executive and social justice advocate. And over her career, she has worked in criminal defense, civil rights law, and healthcare law. And most recently, she served as executive director for the Massachusetts Appleseed Center for Law and Justice, a public interest law center that promotes equal rights and opportunities for Massachusetts residents. Rep Moschino graduated from Harvard University with a BA in English and earned her JD from University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. She was honored with a 2014 Top Women in Law Award by Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly. A longtime active member of the Women's Bar Association, Rep Moschino is now a member of its emeritus board. And she's a fierce advocate for um, climate change and for racial and economic justice. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Rep Moschino. Oh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, I just wanted to also thank um, uh, Sarah Gomez as well for, for thinking to invite me here today. Um, this is uh, truly a labor of love for me. And I'm just so honored and delighted uh, that you included me uh, in your session today. Before we get started, um, Sarah had asked me if I would um, speak a little bit to my life path, um, <laughs> which I always think is a funny question uh, because it makes so much more sense now how I tell the story um, that I'm a state representative and elected official <laughs> than it did as I was sort of navigating my way through it. Um, but I, I guess what I wanted to just share with you all was that uh, you're, you're at a, a wonderful, fantastic university and you are lifelong learners. Um, it, by definition, that's who you are um, because you're here. And I think that everybody who takes that piece with them um, on their journey through life, because it is a journey. I know it sounds very cliche to say it, um, but it's as much about um, pursuing your interests and picking up, um, you know, just different um, skill sets along the way and keeping your eyes open for opportunities or just even embracing things as they happen. Um, you know, I went to Harvard, I was an English major, um, but what most people don't realize is that I grew up in a coastal community of Hull um, and my dad was a teacher but he was also a lobsterman. And so I have spent more hours on the sea than you know, most people um, you know, ever even hope to do. And so you know, from that love of my environment and that love and sort of close relationship with the natural environment and how it intersects with the built environment, uh, it should be no surprise that eventually I should wend my way towards these kinds of issues. Um, I was very much eager to go to law school. I was very much eager to be, um, you know, a criminal defense lawyer. I love the action. Like, let me just say it. I love the action. I know this about myself. Um, and, you know, when I got married, my husband and I went to Texas because he got a great job down there. And I was able to also get a job in criminal law. But then his work brought us back here. And at that moment, you have to pivot. And it, the job that I got was in a healthcare setting. Uh, and instead of in litigation, it was actually in uh, transactional work and negotiations, uh, which has, you'll hear through this talk, has stood me very well, um, learning how to negotiate and um, how to think about what other people need and want and how you get to yes. You'll hear that theme through this discussion. Um, so I think if there's a lesson to be learned from my life, it is, you know, sort of take the opportunities when they present and every once in a while, take a moment to think about where you are, what you're doing, how it's going. Are you still feeling challenged and excited and fresh? And, um, and if the answer to those questions is no, start to think ahead about what could be a next cool step in your career. 
what kinds of experiences, professional skill sets do you want to acquire? And then randomly <laughs> you will land uh, back in your hometown, four blocks from where your mom lives, uh, your dad lives, and, um, and you know, you do something crazy like run for a local office. And I like to say is that um, in that moment when I perceived that there was an issue going on in our community um, and I thought, you know, I don't know much, but I know I can do better than those guys. And I stepped forward for public service and I loved it tremendously. I did, that surprised me. I didn't expect that. Um, and it was running for selectmen that led me to seek out a job doing public policy and advocacy with the Appleseed Center. And then it was Appleseed that brought me back to, instead of a local focus, a more regional and a more statewide focus and really looking for the areas that are ripe for systemic reform. So another theme you'll hear through here. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you um, as we're getting started. And uh, you'll see that um, you'll see that pop up throughout um, this talk. Um, but I would also just remind everyone here that um, when you're looking for that next opportunity, you're telling a story and you're sharing parts about yourself and what you bring to the table. And think about that as, as you're listening to me talk today, um, because I draw from all parts of the, my background and I don't talk about all the different things. You don't always hear me talk about being a healthcare lawyer, um, but those things, you know, all of those experiences, whether they're positive or negative are things that you bring with you. So Anyway, without further ado, enough about me. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the 2050 roadmap and um, sort of what was the inspiration for that original idea in filing. And I think John is going to share some slides with you so that you can, you don't have to just listen to me talk, you can follow along a little bit. Um, so first and foremost, um, by way of introduction, as I said, uh, I represent the third Plymouth district. Um, these are coastal communities of Hingham, Hull, Cohasset, and Situate. Um, so it should be no surprise to anybody that sea level rise and climate change um, were very present things that as a select woman I was dealing with on a regular basis. Um, and in fact, when I stepped forward to run for higher office, I campaigned on um, sea level rise. I campaigned on resiliency and I campaigned on mitigation, which in 2016, nobody was really talking about, and people weren't campaigning on these ideas, but I was because they asked me the question, what is the single most important issue facing your district? And my answer was sea level rise uh, and climate change. So when I got into the legislature, when you're first um, elected, it is very much territorial and people have areas that they have either become a chair or bills and subject matter that they pursue and, and they come to it for all different reasons. Um, and I was very much interested in this. So I asked to be appointed to the Joint Commission on Telecom, Utility and Energy because I knew and I understood that the decisions that on bills that would be coming through that committee would very much be decisions that would speak to the larger initiatives um, to reduce our carbon emissions and the transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and I was right. Um, those were, even though that's not where all the bills reside, I knew that the bills that were coming forward were gonna be there. And all you have to do is go on to MA legislature, select on a committee, and you can see all of the bills that are pending in front of that committee. And those were the ones where um, I felt like the key players were going to be and that I wanted to be positioned both to learn and to lead and to actually, and to vote and get to say. Um, through that process, um, the first session, uh, the, the big bill that moved was actually the renewable portfolio standards. And the big fight was, should it be 2% increase annually or 3% increase annually? And what I gleaned through that bill moving, um, was a couple of things. First, that most people didn't understand um, sort of the key levers that people were talking about. It's very complicated. Um, second, most people didn't even want to understand it. And I, I don't say that in a bad way. I just mean that it really 
requires you to immerse yourself in it and to really understand some of these big points. And I can just tell you, and um, my legislative aide, John Hamilton's on here, and he can tell you, he can vouch for this one, is that uh, you never know what's going to hit you during the day. And the key role and responsibility of a state representative is actually constituent services and that ebbs and flows. And so sometimes you just don't have the bandwidth or the ability to immerse yourself in these things. But as I began to immerse myself in these space, what became very clear to me as I was trying to decide how to prioritize bills that I wanted to support was there's no plan. And that was really the genesis of this was I started to look at what is the plan for Massachusetts to shrink its carbon footprint. And through that inquiry and that dialogue um, really was what opened up and sort of led me to um, this bill. Um, this is actually a refile um, from Chairman Smizek. Um, who had he had filed this bill a couple of times. And as he was retiring and exiting the legislature, I. I went to him and he educated me on it and he persuaded me that this was the bill uh, that would answer that question for we need a plan. Uh, I, you know, this is a this is an environmental studies group, so I, I don't think I have to explain to you about um, global warming and uh, sea level rise and climate change, but I will observe to you that these um, present as public safety issues, as public health, environmental health, social justice, environmental justice issues. But the solution here is actually an economic one and it's to decarbonize our economy. And that's what the focus of the 2050 Roadmap Bill actually is. We talk about environment, but this is about our economy. And so let me, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set some context and walk you through the actual bill that we filed. And then on the back end, we're gonna talk a little bit about the legislative goals, the drafting, um, the strategy and status. And then you guys can ask me any question you want. Um, John, could you advance the slides? So Massachusetts filed in, or passed in 2008, the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, this is chapter 21N. And what it did was it really was a framework. Um, it mandated a framework for EEA to, and its agencies to coordinate efforts to decarbonize and to achieve our carbon emission reduction goals. They set an initial goal of um, 80% of the 1990 um, emission levels and that they would do this by 2050. Um, but the important thing here is that they actually made that commitment in 2008. And they had an initial plan to get us to 2020 to, to, to um, 2020. Um, and, but the point is, is that we had already made this commitment. And so then the question became was, what's the plan, right? Why is there no plan? And for my part, this is one of the most single most important pieces to sort of acknowledge to my legislative colleagues and, to, and, and as I'm talking about it is because I don't have to argue about, warm, uh, about global warming. We've already decided we're gonna do it. And so the key piece here is that it's about how to focus on making it work for Massachusetts and how to get us to a plan. John, could you advance the slides? So the Global Warming Solutions Act um, really focused on energy, greening the grid. And over the past 10, 12 years, um, in fact, they've taken a number of initiatives and they're all very exciting. Clean energy standards, the REGI program, RPS, procurements of hydroelectric, of wind, um, you know, developing local solar initiatives, microgrids, net metering, um, electric vehicles, um, and there's, been other um, movement in other sectors too. Um, I think about the stretch codes and green communities. And then we've also started tackling some of the resilience pieces, right? Um, the big bond bill, uh, the environmental bond bill for 2018. So these were important key efforts that came as a direct result of implementing the GWSA. Um, and in fact, it's been very successful. Um, it's made Massachusetts a leader. Uh, and if you put to the next slide, and it's worked. Um, so it's just a simple, a simple um, slide that just shows that in fact, um, our greenhouse gas emissions have gone down. I think it's something like 20 million metric tons or it's probably more since we actually put these slides together. 
Um, and that's been a really good beginning. Uh, based on the, I think it was the 2017 or 2018 numbers, they, the reporting lags a little bit. Um, we anticipate that Mass will achieve its 2020 carbon emission goals. And in fact, it's good for the economy. It's even added 110,000 green jobs since the implementation. Um, but what it really is, is it's 10 years worth of experience. And that has illuminated for us what's worked well what needs improvement um, and where some of the barriers are. And I think the question that it begs is, how do we get to 2050? Um, and why is the administration not taking action? Uh, next slide, John. So part of this is, is that we need a plan. That, that is what that said to me, is we need a plan. And part of that is because it's about more than just energy. Um, this is just a simple slide showing you uh, emissions by sector, uh, you know, transportation obviously is the big one, hence the governor's focus on TCI, um, buildings, also um, how we heat our buildings, that's why we see a lot of focus on stretch codes, net zero stretch codes, energy stretch codes, um, but also how to integrate some of these strategies, um, nature-based solutions, carbon sequestration, these kinds of strategies all need to be part and parcel of how we get to 2050. And again, what this says, what this said to me as a legislator was it, we need a plan and it begged um, a next step. Next slide. So basically, simply stated, the 2050 roadmap is the critical update to the Global Warming Solutions Act. And it's based on 10 years of experience with its implementation. Looking at that statement, um, that really sums it up sort of in a nutshell for everybody. That is the point of the 2050 roadmap. And as I, as we looked to how we were going to then figure out the key levers, uh, what we were gonna draft, what our strategies would be, the goal is to pass legislation, to pass an implementation act to update this legislation. And to do that, I need to demonstrate as a legislature to my colleagues, that it's timely, that it's relevant, and that it's ready to be passed. Um, the bill is really there to put in place mechanisms to plan and to implement across 30 years. And that's actually incredibly ambitious. We very rarely look forward more than say five years in any municipal or state or federal planning. But this is ambitious. This is about how to plan over 30 years. Um, John, the next slide. So, the first step is always the bill in the legislative stra strategy is really the bill drafting. Um, and obviously this is a highly complex subject. I am not an expert by any stretch of anyone's imaginations. I'm a healthcare lawyer, right? Um, I'm, I'm a nonprofit CEO. Um, so the first, the very first thing we, I did was to, um, to reach out and identify a key subject matter expert and a partner. And that happened to be the Conservation Law Foundation and a gentleman named David Ismay um, and, um, and his colleague, Amy Laura Khan, who's on this call tonight. Um, they, were the, they were the organization that had been participating in all of the implementation um, commission pieces. They had been following sort of what the administrations have been doing. Um, remember this came in under the Patrick administration and now is being implemented under the Baker administration. In fact, they had filed a series of lawsuits. So I picked the smartest guy in the room and the guy with the biggest stick. Um, and that was a very intentional choice on my part um, because when organizations sue the state a lot, um, legislators tend to steer clear of them, but I went and I engaged with them. And that was probably the single most important thing that I did um, because they, they, knew the they knew the subject matter, they knew the sort of the, the, the landscape, if you will, and, uh, and they were prepared to be strong partners. Um, and what we really did was sat and drafted, um, you know, an update for the existing legislative framework. Now I pause here for a second. That was a choice that I made. You'll notice that there were other bills this session, um, including things like uh, the 100% Renewables, uh, the Futures Act. Um, I mean, there were some really, um, the carbon pricing. So there's some great bills that got filed last session. 
Um, and a lot of what they were doing was really creating new schemas. And what I chose to do was to update the existing legislative framework. Because if you think back to the slide ahead, um, before this, excuse me, um, what it really was doing was, um, it was demonstrating how much success we had had. And I felt that it was smarter to update and to, to build on the work that it was done and to bolster that rather than to take a step back, rework and perhaps lose time when I consider it, when we talk about climate, um, you know, climate change, it's really climate crisis. And what we did was we went through to look for what were, where were they not doing work? Where, was, where were the barriers and what were the key levers for positive action? And in fact, um, you know, it was really to, um, you know, it was really to al align with things like that you would do in any planning scenario. So if you think about it from that perspective, you know, it's strong goals, right? So strong interim goals, aligning with current science, you're going to do all that work, you should be focused on the right goals, transparency, so these kinds of things. And we very much approach this as a dialogue. We Put together a draft and we shared it with God and everyone. And I mean everyone. We went to labor, to the business community, to to leadership, to the administration. If, if you to National Grid and to Eversource, you think of somebody who was a stakeholder at that table or intersected with this in any way. We we threw that out to them and we said, "What do you think?" Because we've already made the choice. We've already got the law in place. This is about how to make it more effective, more efficient, um, and to actually achieve our goal. So I didn't have to fight with them about whether or not we're doing this. It was just a question of, did I pick the right levers? And in fact, um, we had some fantastic engagement, most notably from the administration, um, from the IOUs, uh, as well as from, uh, and it was really national, it was really national grid, it was terrific. Um, and as well as the municipal light plants, um, they also had some ideas about uh, as power generators, power procurers, um, how this might work. And it resulted in a clean energy standard just for them. So that was, that was a huge win. Um, the next slide, John. So essentially uh, the roadmap bill uh, resets the 2050 reduction um, target to net zero um, to align with, uh, um, with the current um, was it ICP, IPCC reports, um, it creates a comprehensive people-centered plan to reach net zero. And really that's about, um, you know, that's about um, multiple pathways. That's about thinking about how it impacts low and moderate income environmental justice. It requires strong 2030 and 2040 interim limits. I don't care what anyone says. 30 years is a long time. If you, to stay focused, you have to be setting interim goals to achieve. It's just, that's just good planning. Um, but we set ambitious goals in an effort to, um, to drive in innovation, right? We know what we could do now, right? This, this is solving global warming, right? This is solving climate change. We know we can do right now. So what we really need to think about is how we get ourselves to 2030 and you have to drive innovation. Remember, I started by saying this is an economic bill. Um, we also created more transparency and accountability with public process, with better reporting, accountability to the legislature to really, um, to try, dare I say, it's, it's about accountability, but it's also about, um, it's about being an iterative process. You know, this is supposed to be a flexible process. Uh, something's not working, you know, try something different. Um, and that's why you have the multiple pathways. So you don't have to just commit to one thing and try to think about how to get from here to 30 years from now, but um, how, what are the pathways? Um, and also gives us a way to talk about our successes. So do we want to say clear cut forests and put up solar, or do we want to take into account carbon sinks and make choices about where we actually do power um, generation. And it would give the tools, the uh, necessary, uh, the administration, excuse me, necessary tools to reach net zero. And um, th those are some technical things that we can talk about if you guys are really that interested in it. Um, the next, um, and then I just threw this up here. So the, the next generation roadmap that is pending now is really, based on the 2050 roadmap that I drafted, but the bill ended up being a vehicle. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And I just wanted to show while we're talking about what's in the 2050 roadmap, I just wanted to show you um, what came out of the house, um, grid modernization, low-income solar. I mean, these, these are 
these were really fantastic bills that other people had filed and drafted. And the 2050 roadmap um, became the vehicle for them, and uh, which was, uh, was really important because it moved a lot of really great legislation. And the House bill that passed on the floor in July, I thought was just a great bill um, all the way around. So anyway, the next slide. So let the first thing you do, so now we know we have a bill, we've been tossing it out there and we have to frame our advocacy. Um, so I just threw this up here um, because, you know, reading bills is actually not that easy. Um, they're, they're technically drafted, it's a technical subject matter. And this is actually, you know, market-based um, compliance mechanisms. Everyone would call me and be like, what the hell is that? I was like, that's carbon pricing. <laughs> so I just wanted to just give you an example of why you have to really frame the advocacy. You can't just throw it out there like it's a good idea. Um, you have to make it accessible to people. And that's what I learned from that, that session with, um, you know, around the, the renewable portfolio standards is people don't necessarily know that stuff. And so they need a way into understanding the bill and what it's gonna achieve and how to talk about it um, from their own perspective and to think about why they should support it. You have to know your audience. There's just no other way to say it. You have to know who you're talking to and what this could mean to them by way of example. I don't have to debate whether or not global warming is real or whether it's caused by man-made efforts to persuade the person with child is standing next to the school bus, breathing in a two, um, two times a day dose of particulate matter that has for a child who has asthma. I just have to persuade them that we're going to, as part of this effort, electrify bus vehicles and bus fleets. That's all they have to know to get on board with this. They can disagree with every other thing. So keep in mind that, you know, it's not, you don't necessarily have to um, throw down or persuade or have everyone on board with every single component of it. If there's a piece there that is relevant to them and important to them, that can be enough. And so how you talk about it, um, you have to know your audience and what's important to them and how to get them to a yes. It also opens up a lot of opportunity for broader support. When we went to the gas pipe fitters and the plumbers who very much support natural gas and new pipelines, um, you know, the conversation I had with them was, look, this is a 30 year transition period. This is a 30 years of planning. We have lots of infrastructure. You will have lots of work to do, but wouldn't you rather get on board with 30 years worth of new work and a new sector that you're a critical part of as opposed to one project that's maybe 18 months worth of work and that you're not even going to actually get it because we're um, you know, a prevailing wage state. So you know, there's a lot of different ways to talk about these things. And in fact, um, you know, people, people are receptive when you talk to them about from their perspective. The next page, Don. So in fact, um, when we were framing the, the legislative advocacy, uh, it really was about how to make the ideas accessible and, um, and, and honestly, I just can't say it enough. This is an economic bill and it's great to talk about the co-benefits to the environment, but this is very much about decarbonizing the economy. And you have to talk to people about it that way because they will think about it from their own perspective of, can I afford to do this? Can I adopt this? You know, will I be able to you know, buy, afford an electric vehicle? They think about those things. So you have to talk about it from the way that people will think about it. And in fact, that's the mechanisms that we've chosen. Um, it is hugely important to have a consistent message. Um, once you decide on that message, um, you really have to stick with it. You cannot fluctuate. Um, yes, we change along the way sometimes to adapt, but um, consistent messaging. And quite frankly, it's also about, you know, the people who are putting it forward. When I walk into the bill and ask for time into the building and ask for time with, you know, leadership or other members, they think Joan Moschino, climate change roadmap bill. And so part of the branding is also me being very consistent in what I'm asking for as well. Um, engage diverse supporters. We just talked a little bit about why that is. Um, and focus on your target audience. This is legislation. This is about moving something in the building. 
Um, and there's a lot of interplay from what's going on outside and how we percolate that up um, and how we talk about it, but we have to talk about it the way that we need the people who get to decide will hear it. And I just threw this down the bottom um, so you can tell I'm a transactional attorney at heart. Every time you speak to a decision maker, it is a negotiation. And that's why you have to frame it and stick with it and, and, and stay with it. Um, next slide, John. Um, so the legislative strategy, this is what you guys all really wanted to hear, I think, was um, how to move it in the House. Um, the House of Representatives is known for um, being um, somewhat um, cautious in its approach to legislation. 160 members, a lot of different opinions, a lot of competition for, um, you know, for time. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not actually just that simple of matter of just decide we're doing it, snap a, a finger and, um, and put forward a bill. I mean, there's a lot of resources that get dedicated towards bills when they're moving. Um, the Senate had been throwing out there um, a lot of bills um, on climate. Um, my colleague and good friend, uh, Senator Mark Pacheco, who was the author of the Global Warming Solutions Act originally, and also had filed pieces of the House of my roadmap bill was one whole bill. He had filed several pieces of that on the Senate side, but he had also filed a, um, a large omnibus bill that was really dense and complicated. And most people looked at it and thought, oh my God, they just didn't even know how to, they just didn't even know how to, it, it wasn't accessible, um, even to people like me who were sort of immersed on it on the committee. And so there was very much two different cultures sort of on the Senate side and on the House side. And after learning that, I decided to file just a House bill. That was a choice. And I employed a, a strategy to educate House members to get them on board to socialize it within the building so that they would be receptive to it, that they would understand it. And then, because you, ha you also have to, to show that people are willing to vote for it, right? So we, it was very much a strategy and we went door to door. I, I had a team. Um, of trusted volunteers, um, you know, Conservation Law Foundation, you know, someone um, who I work closely with in, in the district on these issues, actually two people, and we went door to door. We actually visited with 110 of the 160 members. Uh, took a long time, but we did it. And we would have legislative briefings for their staff to make sure a little little pause here. Everyone wants time with the state rep and the state senator. Sometimes your best bet is getting time with the legislative aide or the chief of staff, because that's the guy that I listen to at the end of the day. When I say, oh my God, it was crazy. What do I need to know? What did I miss? What do I need to focus on? John's the one that, that answers that question. So he's the guy you want to make friends with, just so you know. Um, but we did legislative briefings. So the aides were on board, the legislators were on board. We had informational packets that included one pagers, annotated language, you know, lists of supporters. And we did the individual meetings. And as, as a, it's a lot of work, it took us, a, it took us 18 months and, um, but it paid off in spades. It really did pay off. Um, the next slide, John. Um, and now it comes to the building of the consensus. So there's the inside the building of educating people. And then there's the outside of the building showing that we can build consensus. This requires key stakeholder engagement um, and a lot of external partners. Um, again, you know, we had a whole coalition that we would meet with on a fairly regular basis just to touch base, to hear what people were doing, um, to, to sort of keep that touchstone of how we were talking about the bill and um, you know, just to strategize who we should be reaching out to, who people could introduce us to. And what it does is it, it, it builds consensus within the advocacy community. Um, and that cannot be understated how important that was because we were talking about it um, you know, as a consensus bill, right? So. Everybody has their priority bills, right? Every, my job is not to pass other people's legislation. My job is to pass the 2050 roadmap to get that bill to the floor. That was my sole goal, get the bill to the floor. And, you know, people pick their, 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 their mechanisms, they pick their bills, they pick their ideas. And there were a lot of 
co competing bills out there for attention and for space. And so what we would say to people is like, I understand that's your, this other thing is your priority bill, but this is a consensus bill. And pretty much everyone was on board with the fact that these mechanisms needed to happen. And what we did was we built um, a grassroots organization and we availed ourselves of other grassroots organizations, say for example, 350 Mass, Elders Climate Action was fantastic. And they would literally go and talk to every single state rep um, and say, hey, do you know about the roadmap bill? Let me explain to you about the roadmap bill. If you have questions, talk to Rep Moschino about the roadmap bill. And you know, there was a couple of funny stories where there's one rep in particular, they just kept going in and going in and every single time he would say, I'm not telling you who it is. He would say, huh, I never heard of that. And I would call him and I'd be like, hey, <laughs> you know, I had a cell phone. I'd be like, oh, so I just talked to Susie Smith, you know, like um, she told me and I, and I would remind him and it was just our way of positive sort of touches just to say, you know, don't forget this. There's consensus and people once legislators start hearing that there's consensus, then they start to look to see if it's well vetted and if it's timely, if it's ready. Um, and the nice thing about this particular coalition was we had some really diverse supporters. I mean, no lie, it was like the meteorologists. We it was a sent a letter in, which is unheard of. They don't they don't do legislation. It's not what they do, but they sent something in on this. Um, you know, there were others like the American lung association right there were just a lot of different a lot of labor a lot of different people um really started to hear about it it's a ton of work though uh the next slide john so i just wanted to before we conclude i just wanted to um share a couple of things that i hopefully you've heard me say along the way here and i just wanted to pull them out for you play the long game this takes work it took it actually took two and a half years uh, in 2018, we drafted it. I didn't even know if I was going to get reelected. I had, we had already drafted it and already started the advocacy on that. I got reelected and we filed the bill. So it had already been ongoing for um, the better part of six months. I had already talked to the Speaker of the House about it. Uh, I'd already talked to, le to the leadership about the fact that I was going to be filing it. You have to play the long game because you're setting goals, you're setting strategies, you're setting, you're choosing your tactics. Um, and those will all adapt to, to whatever you're trying to do. Um, but in here, we were trying to create opportunity. And, you know, we had to be ready, like when obstacles come up, you, you, you can't be just reacting in the moment, you have to think about how you're either going to get around them, how you're going to turn it to an opportunity. And, you know, there's a lot of competing efforts and you have to listen for how other people are talking about it and how you can partner within the building as well. And you, it's really, you just have to be nimble. But if you don't have that strategy and those goals in mind, um, you risk running sort of, you know, just diverting your, your attentions and energy. You have to be single focused, but stay nimble. Um, the other thing was relationships matter. Um, I can't even tell you how many times people come in and sit in front of us in these committees and they say things like, you know, this is a great idea. It's like, good for you. I have no idea who you are. You have to really cultivate a dialogue, even with your opponents, right? Even with the opposition, because that gives you an opportunity to create, you know, to create some consensus, even between people who disagree. Um, you know, understanding why people disagree or why they might choose a different, um, you know, a different mechanism or why they're just afraid of it or just disinclined to do it. You, you really have to understand those people because you're navigating competition within the building for attention and for, and for advocacy. You're, you might be able to neutralize your opposition. One of the proudest moments I had was when um, the National Power Generators Association came in um, New England Power Generators Association came in and testified in support of part of this bill, the carbon pricing. They're like, just do the carbon pricing. And I was like, oh my God, I must fall off my chair. So, you know, it's like people surprise you, but you have to understand where they were coming from. They were already due carbon pricing through the regional greenhouse gas initiatives, which is cap and trade. And they were used to that and they were okay with that. So, um, so when you understand people, um, and sometimes you can neutralize, um, you know, people noticed who did, but they also noticed who didn't oppose the bill. Um, and, and that's how you're able to bring people on and to negotiate um, things. Do the work. 
everybody has a great idea and people toss out the ideas all the time, but you have to then be able to enact it um, and to, um, and to take action around it and to move it. You have to understand your role. My job was to get that bill to the floor. I asked for, I talked to leadership ahead of time. I talked to the chair of, um, of environment, natural resources and ag. I talked to the committee members. I asked for an early hearing. I got it. I asked for an early bill release and I got it. And then that gave me the pathway um, to really work with House Ways and Means and leadership to move the bill because my bill came out first. So my bill was the one that was moving and I understand what my context is. And to understand that it's a bill that's moving, then that's a reason for people who might've had different choices to come in behind it and say, let's help her move her bill because then, our, then it's a vehicle and maybe we can append ours to hers. And those are the kinds of strategies, understanding your context, understanding your role in those things. Environmentalists have a different role in that, in that, in that space, right? They're the ones saying, pay attention to this, pay attention to this. We think this is important. We think this is valued. We think this is vetted. Um, so John, the last slide, and then I promise I'll shut up. Um, I just thought you'd want to know where it was at. Uh, this has had a crazy history. Um, thank you, COVID. So I filed the bill. Um, that was House um, 832. That was the original. Every time you do something with the bill, it changes numbers <laughs> just to make me crazy. Um, but I asked for that early vote, that early hearing, and I got it. And I asked for the, um, I asked for an early vote, and then COVID hit. Um, so what happened was we were um, coming around. Um, it, it it came for, out of committee on I think at the end of July, and then we were talking to leadership in the fall. They were going to do transportation first. They were going to wait to see what the Senate came out with with their um, next generation bill, which was exciting. Um, and then we were going to take up um, the global. Uh, they were going to take up the roadmap bill, and COVID hit. Uh, we had to figure out how to do our jobs, which we did, and then we were able to um, bring it to the floor the following July, um, and we passed, um, which I thought was a great bill, as I said. Um, the 2050 roadmap, which was 40, House 4933. Now we have two bills and it has to go to conference committee um, because you have to reconcile the differences. But there, we all knew it would be successful ultimately because um, all the parts of the roadmap were in there. And there was a lot of really great sort of interplay behind um, between the two bills. And, you know, there were a couple of outstanding issues. You, I'm sure you heard about the environmental justice dialogue that was going on. Um, but ultimately, they had, um, they did come to agreement and that's the conference report um, that, that came out. The problem was it came out so late at the end of session. So even though we'd extended it, we didn't vote it until January 4th. Now the governor has already committed to big parts of his bills, but he took exception with other things, but he has no time. He has his 10 days, but it, there's no time to send it back to us with, um, with changes. So he just vetoes it and sent back a letter. And then once we reconvened on January 6th and we were all sworn in for a new session, they refiled the act, um, creating a next generation roadmap. That was the conference bill, typos and all, as Senate, as Senate 9. So um, that's what's pending right now because then he could send back um, changes to the bill. Not, he didn't have to just veto it. He actually could send back amendments. And that's what we're considering right now. So with that, I will shut up. I apologize for talking so long and hopefully you guys will have some questions for us. Um, never tell yourself to shut up. Uh, we always <laughs> wanna hear from you. And so we have a couple of questions and while I'm reading them, I'm also just gonna throw out to my students that we were asking a bunch of questions this morning that are relevant, please ask them. Um, but we'll start with um, from Ben Chu. What role does increased fracking play in the decrease in CO2 emissions Massachusetts has seen in the last 10 years? Interesting question, very technical. Um, so essentially fracking, right, is how we get at natural gas in, um, in Pennsylvania, I think is the closest to us. And in fact, natural gas was the key piece when we switched over from oil and coal to natural gas power plants, um, that transition actually helped us get um, the first sort of the first goal. 
That being said, that is not a long-term strategy. Um, and that is exactly the point of the, goal, of the flexibility of the 2050 roadmap plan is that you do sometimes have to do things to transition. It's not ideal. Um, and, but the point is, is that we got ourselves so far, that's a win. And how you define the win matters, but now we have to take the next steps. We can't just rely on that for forever. We have to keep going. Um, so that is, that's an incredible, that's a great question. Uh, it's a very sophisticated question. Uh, there's a bunch of them. So I'm gonna keep going. Uh, so a recent Brown study cited the lack of transparency in the Massachusetts State House as one of the top barriers to achieving climate legislation. In your experience, has the lack of transparency inhibited climate legislation and how would you how would greater transparency benefit the work you do? So transparency is an interesting issue. Um, so there's the inside the building and there's the outside the building and people outside the building should absolutely know what we're doing. Um, you know, I think everyone understands that piece that transparency in government um, and I should just pause and say, you should make sure you have a good relationship with your state rep and your state senator um, because being able to pick up the phone and being a trusted resource, um, someone who you know, um, you know, when I see your name, that's always important um, part of the relationship. But that being said, um, that was not my experience at all. My experience really had more to do with the fact that sometimes these are, are, are very complicated bills and you have to trust your colleagues on the committee work to do those, to do that work. People come in, they testify, we hear all of the things, but then there's work product and and that interplay is led by the person, whoever is leading, who filed that bill and who's leading that advocacy. Um, so to some extent, I, I feel like it's a false issue um, because once, you're, once you get to that level, uh, it's really about, it's about getting their attention on it, getting them to devote resources to it and, and prioritizing all of that. Um, you know, I'm not sure how people would have prioritized this against say the Student Opportunity Act, which was a transformative investment in education equity. I'm not sure. Um, all I know is I'm responsible for advocating for this bill. So I think it's a great question that you're asking in terms of, of the, the transparency. Um, but I think the transparency focus should be more on how is the administration doing the work, that reporting to the public, that accountability to the legislature. To me, that's where the transparency focus has been the problem. And that's actually what this bill is designed to solve. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. I hope so. Um, so I'm just going to remind folks to, that we're taking questions through the Q&A and not the chat. So I'm looking at the Q&A. Um, and we'll just keep going down the line because there are lots of good questions. So. Um, I am wondering, so from the, the questioner, um, my TA, uh, I'm wondering how you made such a similar, made sure such a similar bill was being considered on the Senate side at the same time, which kind of comes to the kind of collaboration and, yeah. and, and also a transparency question. So sometimes, um, so when you file a bill, the um, essentially what you, you need to decide what your strategy is. I chose, to file this bill as a House bill. I did not go and seek a Senate partner. That being said, Senator Pacheco, who is, has been doing this for decades longer than I am, is incredibly seasoned and, 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 and much more well-versed in these issues, was also having a conversation with our partner, Conservation Law Foundation. And so what we discussed was that we already knew that the Senate was receptive to the bill because he had put it together as a part of a larger omnibus bill, but they couldn't get a traction on the House side. And so what I persuaded him was to let me work the House and to really, to take the steps to really educate and find the path in so that members of the House would both understand it, be receptive to it, and to hear about it um, in positive ways. Uh, and that's what I was, every once in a while, I'd be like, Joan, Joan, He's like, are you going to, are you going to, is the house going to vote for this? I'm like, I swear to God, I swear to God. I was like, just let me work the building. Right. And so like, I'm being facetious and, but in some ways that's exactly what we were doing. Um, and, and so you, each bill has its own path and trajectory. Um, and this was the one we picked for this one. 
So thinking about, uh, there are a couple of good questions about implementation. So I wanna kind of think about them together. So one is, um, what are the challenges that you anticipate in the implementation and, and regulate regulation of the rope mill bill once it becomes law? Because we're we're just going to go with that. It's going to be law. It's going to be law. Um, you know, how do you keep the momentum going? Um, how do you get that transparency on the on the administrative side? And then also, um, given that much of this work is very incremental, do you worry that we're not going to be moving fast enough? Yes. Um, so we chose. Um... And this is one of the points of contention with the governor right now. He's lowering from 50% to 45%. But honestly, that's not the real issue. The real issue is, is that I created a floor and he's creating a ceiling. So he's saying, we're only going to strive to this much. Whereas I was saying, you're going to do at least this much and, 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 and really strive to do more if we can at all possible. And I think it's important the way we're talking about it. This is, this is legislation at the, it's, it's creating or it's updating an existing framework that's supposed to drive planning for 30 years. That's the point. So to, your, to answer your question, creating that floor as opposed to a ceiling, is supposed to drive the innovation. 50%, even 45% is an ambitious goal. That is, that is about that. The difference I think is something like, you know, whether or not 750,000 people buy electric vehicles versus 1.2 million. Like, I mean, it's substantial. It's substantial that 5%. But the point is of the legislation is to, to push them to strive for it and to drive the innovation. Now they have already done They'd known that this was coming, and of course, Conservation Law Foundation sued them on multiple occasions to push them to do it. And so your, out, your outside advocacy groups really can weigh in mm -hmm. and can push from, from a sort of like a, think of it as, um, as, a, as a stick, but it's not very nuanced. But the administration, to their credit, hired good people and has already done the, the, the back cast analysis, uh, which is the schedule of emission reductions, and is starting to do the planning for the next 10 years, for the 2030. Um, and, I, and I'm sure um, Amy Laura can give you, um, you can follow that dialogue, it's happening right now. And I would encourage you as members of the public to weigh in and comment on that plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's that piece, that, that was the whole point of more or better reporting and to the young man who earlier asked about the transparency, that was the point of where the transparency is, is so that we know we're making progress we're pushing and calling for it as citizens, engaged citizens, and we're working and supporting organizations, you know, like the Nature Conservancy is on the implementation committee. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily have to be like, a, you know, a law center or um, an over or overtly political organizations. I mean, some of these things are just sub subject matter experts. And those are the key mechanisms that will keep pushing it forward. The last piece I'll remind, I'll just mention is that it's meant to be responsive also and um, reporting back and accountable to the legislature. And um, you, should, you should definitely invite maybe the chair of Telecom Utility and Energy to come in or, or Carol, Rep Dykema from ENRA to talk about the suite of bills that are being filed right now to take up the rest of this work. We're doing some work in stretch, stretch codes, um, net zero stretch codes. We filed some um, zero emission vehicle bills. Um, you should see all the recycle. Um, let's not forget the importance of recycling uh, initiatives on net zero uh, recycling um, and all of those things and everything in between. So, so it's it's about whether and so we're putting the mechanisms in place, but it's it's about whether or not people call for it. So 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 people young people call for it. So I'm gonna to try to fit a couple more in here. Um, one is, is there in, the, in this bill, is there any way to provide express space for community leadership, particularly from environmental justice communities or how can that be achieved at a state level? And how have you seen community organizing and most effectively transition into policy? So it's a very interesting question. Um, the bill itself is a mechanism for planning, but some of the bills that came along Great. I talked about it being a vehicle. Um, and one of the big bills that came along with it was the environmental justice language that Michelle Dubois and Adrian Madero had put forward, which is very exciting. This is the first time it's going to be codified really in law. So we know that it will be meaningful mechanisms. Um, 
and you know what I think. So essentially, we're also filing, and uh, Amy Laura has worked on this with us as well, a bill to create standing in courts for disparate impact. And I'll let her explain all of that to you, but it's a standing bill that then will allow regular citizens in Massachusetts to make a claim in court to say they're not honoring something like the environmental justice bills. So it so bills that will flow from it will also create mechanisms um, to, to make sure that things like that are implemented. The interesting part about your question though is grassroots organizing and I think organizations like Elders Climate Action, which I just love them. They, they, have, they say, all right, we're doing this. And then they figure it out. And they just, they have so much experience. It's really fantastic. Um, but then also um, 350. And then some of, um, I'm just spacing on some of the, the youth organizing. And honestly, if people are calling for and, and keeping these kinds of ideas and issues in the forefront, that's what legislators pay attention to. Um, because you can't be an expert in everything. You can't know everything. And so what your, what your community brings to you and how they bring it to you matters. Um, you know, just throwing down a legislature saying you have to fix this doesn't help someone who doesn't know and answer that question. Um, but connecting and, and educating and, um, and, and that ongoing dialogue cannot be understated. So there are all these other great questions that I wish I could ask you about um, clear cutting trees and, and carbon sequestration and, and um, also offshore wind. But I know that um, Coco was going to tell us that we are at time. So <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much. This was fantastic. I know I, I learn so much every time I, I get to talk to you. Oh, you guys are fantastic. I, I just am delighted by your interest in this subject matter. And, you know, I really have just firmly convinced that your generation is going to um, solve the problems of the world. And I think it's a fantastic start that you're getting such a terrific or a terrific education. It's such a wonderful, uh, wonderful school and, and it's a great program. So I'm just honored that you even thought to ask me in. Thank you so much. Great to meet you, Joan. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Colin. It, it's a pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. And I just hope that next time that there'll be a next time and that we'd actually get to meet in person. I think that'd be a lot, a lot more fun than just listening to me talk on a screen. It was wonderful. <laughs>